tiptoeing through here, homeboy. <laughs> How you leaving out? We all. Yes, we got uh, we got whatever I had the other day. Yeah. It was on me the other day. You huh? Hey, bring me now. Not talking, Not talking. You are my champion. Giants fall in. You stand undefeated. Every battle you won. I am who you say I am. And you crown me with confidence I feel. In the heavenly place under me. With the one who has conquered it all. I try so hard. So long to believe it, you choose. 
rivers that flow, and it produces life. Not only life in your own body, but whoever's around you, it will produce life into whatever area is dead in their life. Whether it's in their body, in their finances, in their home, in their family, in their relationship, if you'll begin to allow those rivers of living water to flow out of you, you will produce life wherever you go. Now, let's look at John chapter 5. Now, I know this ain't, look, let's find our there's, there's, there's one page on tongues and interpretation. So I'm going to read a few things out of the book that goes along with this, okay? Um, the manual is a skeleton. It's, it's an outline. It's something to get you digging in a little deeper, okay? That's what the manual is. So if we don't go word for word uh, out of the manual, don't worry about that. It's, it's an outline. It's a skeleton. It's something to get you digging deeper. Uh, but I, I want to read this. Let's look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5 talks about the pool at Bethesda. Y'all know the story? Yeah. The lame man at the pool of Bethesda. Uh, Jesus heard about the man at the pool. It was said that at a certain season, an angel came down and troubled the water. Now, I, I like, I think it was in the Chosen that I saw this, where the angel was swimming around in the water. I think it was on one of the episodes, or I heard it somewhere, I don't remember, but I can picture this angel coming down at certain times, just enjoying himself in the water, swimming around, flashing around, troubling the water, right? It was said that at a certain season, an angel came down and troubled the water. They were all waiting for the water to get troubled. Now, do you realize the whole time the whole time that they were sitting around waiting for the water to get troubled, the one who was sending the angel to trouble the water was walking around in the temple. Yeah. Think about that. It's, it's funny because we wait. Most of the time we wait for an evangelist to come in that operates in the gifts of something that we need, right? That's waiting for the troubling of the water. When the one that troubles the water now is already in you. It's, it's already in you. The rivers of living water is in you. When you speak in tongues, you're troubling the water, right? You're stirring up the water. You're stirring up that life. You're stirring up that gift that's in you. And boom. Well, just like these people sitting around the pool waiting. Here's the one that's sending the angel walking around. Nobody's looking at him. Everybody's still looking at the water waiting. And he's walking in the midst of them. And ain't that just like us today? We're waiting for somebody else to come when the one that's already came is in us. The one that's already brought life is in us. The one that's already here is in us and comes out of us. But we're still waiting on someone else to come. And really, what you're what you're teaching is it's not it's not to condemn us, but it's no, like, no. it's to make us aware like these things happen by faith. Yeah. And so faith comes by hearing. hearing. And so you're you're saying, look, you know, what if you? Yeah, it's okay to believe. Hey, Jory could pray for me, and right. and, and and you know, because Jory has strong faith and. He has a lot of experience, and Jory's seen a lot of things, and he's really bold about that. So and when I'm sick, I'm like, hey, Jory, will you come and pray for me? You know, and, and where I'm at, there may be nothing wrong with that, but you're saying, hey, look, the same thing that's in me is in you. And then you. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to wait. Right. You don't have to go wait by the pool. You don't have to go go to this big revival and go to Redding, California, where the, the Holy Spirit's moving. You, right. you have the Holy, the same Holy Spirit lives inside of you. He can move for you just like you can move there Absolutely. if you ask Him, if you believe. Yeah, and that's right. It's encouragement. Yeah. I want you to know, look, James said, is there any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil and pray the prayer of faith. That was for baby Christians. When you mature in Christ, it's encouragement. I want you to know you don't have to go 3,000 miles to get what's already in you. Yeah. You can release it into your own flesh. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that dwells in you and quickens or makes alive your mortal body. Yeah. 
So, right, it's encouragement. It's not condemnation. He said, he said, I want you to prosper and be in good health as your soul, which is your mind, your right. emotions, prosper. Right. So as we renew our mind, well, our health, and our, you know, we're going to prosper in right. our bodies and because we're changing the way we think. So the Spirit's already done. It's finished. Yeah. It's new. But we got to move. Yep. And that's why that's why we're learning. That's why we're why do we keep going, man? Why are we talking about tones and the Holy Spirit, the baptism? Why have we been talking about this? I mean, we've been talking about this for years. Why why is it so important? You know, because like once you get it and you allow the baptism of the Holy Spirit to work in your life, to me it's like an accelerator. It's like throwing yep. gas on the fire. Yeah. Know? It's like if, if you you see people that are kind of new in the faith and they've been in the faith two or three years, you see people that have been in the faith forty years and these young ones are like burning up with fire, well, how are they getting, well, it's that baptism of fire, you know, they're, they lit, and they're they keeping it stirred up, they're keeping it stoked, yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so, they were all waiting for the water to get cold, the whole time, Jesus is walking around, uh, they could have gone to him and got healed at any time, they didn't have to wait until the water was troubled, that's what we're saying, you don't have to wait, don't. You got it in you. Our problem is, and I, we've already said this, is that we want to wait for the troubling of the water rather than be connected with the one that can trouble the water at any time and keep it troubled. How do you keep it troubled? Jude says, building up yourself on your most holy faith by praying in the Holy Ghost. That's how you keep it troubled. Paul said, I thank God that I pray in tongues more than you all. Paul <laughs> kept the waters troubled. And it got him in a lot of trouble with the religious people. <laughs> Look, you know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Let's go here. Here's the key for us. He says, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That's the troubling of the water. You get that. If living water is coming out of you, it's trouble. All that means is that you stir the water up. That's all it means. That's why he tells you, you stir up the Holy Spirit that's in you. God does not, look, the Holy Spirit is not going to push you. He's going to lead you. you got to take the step. God's never going to get behind you and push you. He's going to lead you. you got to take the step. you got to open your mouth. You've got to release the waters, the rivers of living water, out of you. He's not going to take your tongue and move your tongue for you. It'd be great if he did, because it would have been a whole lot easier to start speaking the tongue. Uh, here it is. Uh, uh, you're not working. You know. He's not going to, you have to release it. You know, it's good. I, I got a young lady in my, in my life team, and she had never spoken in tongues before. And since I've been teaching this, she uh, texted me the other day, and she's like, well, I asked her a couple of weeks ago. She said, I, I feel something right here. I said, if it's right there, let it come out here. She, you know, and then she texts me a week later, and she's like, she's starting to speak. It may be one syllable, but it's coming out. She realized she's got to open her mouth and speak it. If you, if you, look, your lips can be an outflow or it can be a dam, Right? Sometimes it needs to be a damn. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's good, but yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesus was a master at silence. Yeah. Keeping silent. He was a master at keeping his mouth shut. Well, every word he spoke was the will of the Father. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I wish I, I mean, I, I wish I could say that. You know, I yeah. probably speak 1% of the time. Yeah. <laughs> hey Dory, isn't there a isn't there a verse that says no man can tame the tongue? Cover James three. Yeah. And then it says the Holy Spirit can. Yeah. 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 It says when he does, you'll be perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So you just you, you have to go ahead. I was going to say that's that's one of the keys. We can't do it, but the more we yield and lean into that gift, you know, the more, the more we can tap into that spiritual maturity that. that Jesus only said 
what he heard the father saying, he was given an anointing without measure. Just think what we should be able to do if we could just be healed. There's so much tradition. That bubbling of the water was probably something they did traditionally. Right. Because that's what they were focused on. Jesus right. is like, like Matthew 16, he says, you can discern the weather, right? But you can't discern the season that you're in. Right. He's like, I'm right, right. here. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I'm right here amongst you. Guys. You know, and that's still today, you know, he's like, I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know. He's got these traditions that said, you know, tongues is not for today or whatever. Right. Gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. They die with the apostles and all that stuff. And Jesus is like, no, it's, you know, it's for everybody. It's, it's for all times. It's until I return. Once we get to heaven, it says tongues will cease. That's once we're with him. We're not going to need tongues right. anymore. We're not going to need a word of wisdom anymore. We're not going to need prophecy anymore. We're not going to need healing in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. Right. But until that day, that's how we communicate with him. And that's how we function on the earth. So yeah. we, we need to press into these things. Yeah. There's Absolutely. an urgency to press in. Now more than ever. Yeah. 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 Now more than ever. There is an all-out attack on Christians, and uh, it always has been. But it seems like the enemy's stepping up his game, and it just seems like the church is not in the place it needs to be. Uh, maybe we are. You know, maybe the Bible's coming to pass like it's supposed to, and uh, you know. But I want you to be built up, encouraged, charged up, ready, <coughs> not for. I, I told my team this last night. We need to be ready for whatever comes before us. Not for a fight. Our fight's not with flesh and blood. Our fight with spiritual wickedness, rules of darkness. Uh, it's with the enemy. It's with it's a spiritual warfare. We need to be ready not only to battle in the spirit, but to love people. Right? You, you don't condemn people. You don't bring people down, you don't put them down, you don't, uh, you love people. You don't have to love where they're at, you don't have to love the sin that they may be in, but you love the people. Our fight is with spiritual wickedness, it's with rulers of darkness, it's with evil spirits. That's our battle. So, it's not with the people, although, it's, you know, that the flesh rises up sometimes and you want to do something with the person, you know, but you can't. Hug them. Right, right. You want to hug them. Hug, hug them real tight. <laughs> Calm down, big boy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's not where our battle is. So, yeah. so uh, again, the key is for us is out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water. You have to stir that gift up. And, you know, the more you pray in tongues, the more you, <coughs> the interpretation of what you're praying is important. You need to know what you're saying. You need to know what the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. It brings edification. It brings strength. It brings comfort. It brings solace. It brings uh, encouragement. It brings all these things. And, you know, we're looking at the story. John Lake, he went to Africa in 1908. He left there on the first day of April and took him about six weeks to get there. He got into Cape Town around May 14th. His family, uh, his, his family, seven children and his wife and two other people went with him. And they were in Africa for about six months. Now, on December 22nd of that year, his wife passed away. I know his wife was back with the people of Dallas at the time. A lot of controversy over how she died. And there was speculation as to the reason she died. Now, during that time, John Lake <coughs> called her death Satan's mouth of destruction. Because they were so in love and so connected. Now, I'll tell you <coughs> that Dowie's people didn't did not grab hold to the baptism of the Holy Spirit like John Lake did. So they were very much against the direction John Lake was going. At the time in Zion, where Dowie's people were, the water that they drank was rainwater. 
they collect the rainwater in barrels and all that the water that they have. They poison, speculation is, they poison John Lake's wife with the rainwater. And that's what killed her. Now, they buried her right away. Because they knew that if John Lake had come back, he would have raised her from the dead. So they buried her right away so that he couldn't raise her from, I guess he could have dug her up and raised her, but uh, so, but there was a lot of controversy. So, but they were so in love and so connected, he called it Satan's master stroke. He was left with seven children. The youngest at the time was 18 months old. There he was in a foreign country with no backing, nobody to support him. He had nothing. His wife passed away while he was off on a trip, and he came back to find out that they had already buried her. He had some other problems going on with the kids, so it really affected him. He began, as usual, by spending a lot of time with God and praying in tongues. What do we do when we're facing heaviness, oppression, heartache, sorrow? What do we do? We cry to everybody else, don't we? John Lake began to pray in tongues. He began to seek comfort in the Lord. Look, again, encouragement. This is, this is where we need to go first. People can hug you. People can comfort you. You need people there for you. But the Holy Spirit's always there. You can always go to Him in prayer. You can begin to, to release the rivers of living water out of your belly, which brings comfort. It brings encouragement. It brings that peace, that love that you need for whatever you're facing, or whether it's a death or something else that's going on in your life. Uh, so he began by spending a lot of time with God and praying in tongues. Then God gave him an interpretation of a message, and he wrote it down. He called it guidance. It was an interpretation of a message in tongues that was given to him privately while he was praying in other tongues. And we see that on page 16. This is what he wrote out of the interpretation <coughs> of praying in tongues. Yeah, well, it's R17, I think. Okay, yeah, you're right. O soul, on the highway from earth unto glory, surrounded by mysteries, trials, and fears, let the life of thy God in thy life be resplendent, for Jesus will guide thee, thou needest never fear. For if thou wilt trust me, I'll lead thee and guide thee, through the quicksands and deserts of life all the way. No harm shall befall thee. I only will teach thee to walk and surrender with me day by day. For earth is a school to prepare thee for glory. The lessons here learned you will always obey. When eternity dawns, it will be only the morning of life with me always as life is today. Therefore be not impatient as lessons thou learning. Each day will bring gladness and joy to the ear, but heaven will reveal to thy soul of the treasure which infinitude offers through ages and years. For thy God is the God of the earth and heavens, and thy soul is the soul who died to save, and his blood is sufficient, his power eternal. Therefore rest in thy God both today and always. It's funny how he got an old English interpretation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, must, he must have read that King James a lot. <laughs> right? <laughs> that is, but you know what? I, it, it is funny because last night, uh, one of the guys in my life came, he was telling me going to the Assembly of God churches, you know, uh, when he was younger or whatever, somebody would stand up and speak in tongues. And then the person would be over here, Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I come up knowing yeah. in the course true. of praise. You know, it was always somebody would speak in tongues and somebody would get up, Thus saith the Lord, Thou art this day. And I mean, yeah. they'd go into the whole thing, you know, in King James. It's like, huh? so that's all I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I had to break out of that. Yeah. I had to break break out of that religious mindset of speak, you know, there's nothing wrong with it, but you go out on the streets, somebody that 
had it come up in church or somebody that don't have a King James and you start to, thus saith the Lord like, today thou art going in the Highlander? Why are you talking like that? What is it? Old English. It's good. You know, church folks love it, but you, like I said, you get on the corner and you start giving words of wisdom or knowledge to somebody or prophesying over somebody on the streets and they're not church and you speaking in King James, they, you know. I heard somebody was, Curry was doing a, one of his seminars and somebody got on to him, you know, that big can't say, there's no J in the Hebrew language. Yeah. But you can't say Jesus, you know. He's like, in Texas, we say Jesus. He's like, if we're getting results of Jesus. We're going to keep saying Jesus. <laughs> if you speak Hebrew and you don't say the word, you don't want to say the name Jesus, so be it. But we're right. getting results of Jesus over in Texas, right. so we're going to keep saying Jesus. <laughs> right, because the people in the back kept saying uh, Yeshua. 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 Yeah, every time he'd say Jesus, Yeshua. Jesus, they'd be Yeshua. You know, every time, and they got to him, and he's like, no, wait a minute, that's, yeah, so. Well, I think God this is where we're at, Yeah. You know? so, but yeah, if you're in the street, you definitely, yeah, you know, I mean, there is a teaching out there, oh yeah, there is a teaching out there right now that says, that's not how you say it, that's not his real name, Jesus, that that's what's written there, and that's why we don't have any power in his name, because we're out, so there is a teaching out there, yeah. an underlying thought and teaching, and like you said, and, well, if that's what you believe, say Yeshua. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeshua's name. Whatever. Do it. <laughs> yeah, he don't care. Yeshua! Yeah, Yeshua! <laughs> yeah, he don't, he don't care. They're definitely, I mean, if you look, if you go back and you look in the DHT, like, I think John G. Light was seeing 30,000 healings a month or a year, and they're seeing that like per month. Right. Now. Yeah. And they're using the name Jesus. So, yeah. Yeah, doing something right. Something's right. working, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so anyway, you know, it's kind of a side note. Yeah, it's good. <laughs> Look, I want you to notice that when John Lake was praying in tongues, it was being prayed out as an interpretation of them. It was the Spirit of God praying through him and glorifying God. It was magnifying God and glorifying Him. At the same time, it was comforting Him, exhorting Him and helping him to cope with the situation he was going through. So, there's, look, there's a, I told you a few weeks ago, I believe that most Christians live a defeated life because they never call on the helper that God sent to abide in us forever. If you never call on the one he sent to help us, where, where is your help going to come from? Where are you going to find that exhortation? Where are you going to find that comfort, that solace? Where are you going to find that encouragement? Where are you going to find life if you never call on the one that is life? Yeah, because life, there's a storm. There's yeah. a storm, you know, life has storms. It's in the, in the Word, but if you build your foundation on the rock and his name is Jesus, when yeah. the storm comes, I mean, your, your mom is going to get, you know, pass away. It's going to happen. She's going to get old. She's going to pass away. You're going to go through that sorrow. <laughs> You know, your your things are going to happen. Things are going to change. Things are going to shift. There's going to be storms in life. I mean, it's going to happen. But if you're rooted, if you're connected to the vine, if you know how to encourage yourself in the Lord by praising the Holy Spirit, yeah, you know, it, it's it's night and day. It's the difference yeah. between night and day. It's now look. Okay, uh, let me be. Let me be. There's, there's no com. Again, I, I like this. Cause there's no condemnation if you're not praying in tongues. You can still be strengthened by renewing your mind to the Word of God. You still have the Spirit of God in you. Yeah. It's just better when you learn to begin to release the river of the living water. It brings, it's, look, He always causes us to triumph, right? And we're, we win regardless, all right? I want you to be encouraged and know that there's more than just where you're at now. And that comes by praying in the Holy Spirit. It keeps you built up, charged up, in tune, on fire, strengthened. It keeps you going forward. And again, it, you know, there's no condemnation if you're not praying in tongues. Just ask the Holy Spirit to let, you know, just do it. It's by faith. So step out in that area. Say, you know what? I want to pray in tongues. I want 
what the Bible talks about. I want everything that God has for me. Every promise in him is yes and in him is yes. I'm an heir and joint heir to the throne. Everything Jesus has and had on earth is mine. And I want it. Yeah? And there's nothing wrong with that. So, anyway. Uh, this is encouragement. This is to get you to the place where you always triumph. You're always walking in victory. You're not walking as a defeated Christian. We're not supposed to walk as defeated Christians. Jesus already defeated the enemy. We just have to remind him that he's defeated. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and that's what we're supposed to do. So, uh, now, uh, another thing I want you to notice about this interpretation, it wasn't a message that was given to him by somebody else. He was praying in tongues to God, magnifying God, and in the process of magnifying God, God was talking to him and answering the need of his situation. Now, I've been here. When I've had questions. When I've had uh, been misdirected or knocked off the track, I went to pray in tongues. And immediately the Lord began speaking to me and putting me back on track and bringing me comfort and strength and showing me the, the direction. But, but, but I can get my words out. Showing me the direction to go. Uh, so I can tell you that this works from my own experience. Again, regardless of what you're going through in life, if you'll just begin to release the rivers of living water, it will produce life into whatever situation is dead. Now, through his own prayer, tongues, and interpretation, he was giving the answer, the solace, and the comfort that he needed. No one else was bringing it to him. It came out of the rivers of living water that were going out of him and coming back into him. Now, I want to look at something in 1 Samuel chapter 30. Y'all may know this story about David. He took his men. Uh, <coughs> we'll just read it. Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1. And it came to pass, when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day, that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken the women captive that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city, and behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Now, I don't know if you've ever been there in your life, but that's down as far as you can go. And you weep until you can't weep no more. David's two wives were taken captive. Ahino, I can't say her name, the Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelites. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters, but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself when nobody else is there to encourage you, when nobody else, when everybody else scatters, you can encourage yourself in the Lord. When David and his men got back, their lands and their city were burned. David's wives and all of the wives, sons, and daughters of all his mighty men of valor were taken away captive. It said that David and the men that were with him cried. They cried until they could cry no more tears. Then it said that after all that, David began to encourage himself in the Lord. They went through the process of grieving. Grieving is normal. You need to grieve. They cried and they grieved, but then they went to David. Now, I want you to notice, it didn't say the men gathered around David and said, don't worry, David, we'll go and get them back. No, no. The men were ready to kill them. Yeah, they were ready to stone them. And they had every good reason to stone them. He was the leader. He took them out to war. They come back and everything was gone. So who are you looking to? 
you made the decision to go forward with whatever it was. Now everybody comes back and it's like, well, what happened? Now they're all looking at you. Yeah. Hey, you're a good guy. This sounds good, Josh. Let's go forward. Yeah. And you come back and everything's just kind of falling apart. Now, well, I thought you said it was going to be good. And now everybody's bashing you. Now what do you do? You better encourage yourself in the Lord. You encourage yourself in the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, think about this. This is everyday life. This is not a story in the Old Testament just to read and that's passed away. This is everyday life. We do things. We make decisions. We go forward. Other people are looking at us and following us and taking notice of us. And then when everything seems to, to fail, we might have got the victory there, but everything back here is falling apart, and now they're looking at you. Well, I, I thought you said if we did this, all this was going to be okay. And now everybody's against you. They were all for you when you was going forward, but all this back here fell apart, and now they're against you. Now what do you do? Do you cower down? Do you fall into the same uh, mother grubs that they're in? That's an old English word, smelly grubs. I don't know if it is. Uh, or do you encourage yourself in the Lord? Yeah. And that's what makes great leaders, you know. Like, yeah. In that time of sorrow, you press into the Lord. Yeah. And, you know, look, they, and this is people, they said, look what you've done to us. Look what you brought us to. We were out fighting for you, and now our families are gone. David had no one there who was coming to him and encouraging him. So he encouraged himself in the Lord. The way he did that was he began to write a song and sing to himself to encourage himself. As he sang the song, he heard himself say how he had gone through trouble, but his God was with him. He knew that his God would help him to overcome those troubles. It says that he would continue to serve God all the days of his life. That came by inspiration. Now, I, I like what he said here. He said, I'm not saying that David spoke in other tongues. He didn't have the Spirit of God in him like we did. He did have the Spirit of God come on him. Now, uh, I'm just saying that the Spirit of God with David began to flow out of him and he began to encourage himself because there was no one else there to do it. Whenever you think you're alone and whenever you think you've got no one to encourage you, you always have yourself. For within yourself, you can pull out wisdom, the counsel, the encouragement, and the comfort of God by the Spirit by praying in other tongues. Nobody else is for you. You have yourself. Go ahead. I'm thinking about in Matthew 7, where he talks about he gives the Sermon on the Mount, and he concludes it with, if you build your house on my word, when the storms come, your house will stand. You know, heaven and earth, the Bible says, will pass away. You can have all the counsel from this, let's just say this, psychologist, psychiatrist, worldly counsel, even maybe from a friend who has worldly wisdom. But the only counsel at the end of the day that's going to stand is the counsel that we receive from the Word of God. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I would, I would encourage people, press into the Holy Spirit. Press into the things of God. You're under attack, you're under oppression, don't lean into worldly wisdom. You know, psychology is a study of a fallen man. You know, we're we're a new creation. Yeah. And I'm not knocking it good Christian counseling, but I'm just saying, if nobody's around, don't try to rush out and find this person or that person. Press into the Lord, encourage yourself, allow the Holy Spirit. Press into the Word of God. Yeah. The Word of God will comfort you. The Word of God will strengthen you. The Word of God will be fortress in a storm, and you'll get to a point where you're not always needing ministry. 
Right. Oh, we're just, let me call this ministry. Right. Let me go over here. No, you can just encourage yourself. You can press into the Word. You can find a Word for your situation and not religiously, you know, uh, quote it or confess it, but like, let it be a heart cry to the Lord. Lord, I thank you yeah. for your strength. I thank you yeah. for your counsel. I thank you for the might that you're giving me right now. I thank you for yeah. the encouragement. And the next thing you know, you're going to preach yourself happy. Yep. You know? Yep. And, you know, it just makes things a lot easier. Now you're not heavy no more. You're not depressed, <laughs> oppressed. Okay? And, you know, I, I agree. Look, there's nothing wrong with counseling. There's nothing wrong with any of this. Because there's times you may not be at a place the encouragement here is that you get to a place of maturity where you don't have to, you can get it out of you yourself. Now, iron sharpens iron. It's good to be with the brother. It's good to fellowship with other people. But I want you to get out of that place to where you're always waiting for the trouble of the water or you're having to go 3,000 miles to get it from somebody that has the same spirit that you have. So, uh, it's easy. Yeah. You just have to release it. You know, and when you get to the place of maturity and you learn how to release it, then you can release it to others. You can be that counselor for somebody else. You can be that one that produces life in others. You can be the one that releases that life and brings freedom. Go ahead. So would that be? Would that be the revelation of John seven? Did the rivers flow out? Yep. And then it can go to, uh, for a good scriptural illustration, you can go to Ezekiel 47, where the water is flowing out of the temple. We are the temple. Yeah. And everywhere the water is going, it's bringing life. Yep. Touching all these different people, it's bringing healing, it's bringing wholeness. It's getting deeper. Maybe it's getting deeper. Yep. You got it. deep. Yeah, it's getting deeper. Yep. Maybe all the way submerged. Yep. All the way submerged. Y'all stand up. We're going to pray about it. <coughs> uh, I don't care who prays it. You want to pray about it, as long as y'all pray it. Huh? Uh, I don't throw it. Throw it to me, man. He prays about it. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Father God, I thank you for the moments of intimacy with you, Lord God, that we just met. Lord God, that it's not religion, but it's it's that deep relationship with you, Lord God. Father God, I thank you for encouragement. I thank you for your love. Father God, I thank you for your heart. And I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit will speak to each and every one of us today about what your heart desires for each and every one of us, individually and corporately. Father God, I pray that in your mercy and grace and your love, which we believe in and trust in, Lord, that you would show us how to stir ourselves up, how to fan into flame the things of the Holy Spirit, that as he dwells in our innermost being, that we would be lighthouses for you. It's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Messiah, we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.